welcome everyone. As uh, people enter, we're just going to give uh, everyone some time to, to enter and get settled. And if you're just joining us, welcome. We're just going to wait a few moments for everyone to enter uh, and get settled. Got quite a few people registered for today. Turns out this is a popular topic in a popular group. And we're just going to just wait a moment or two for everyone to enter. Uh, David, can you still hear me and uh, see me well? Because I changed yep. the settings. Okay, good. Yeah, perfectly. Thank you. Just wait one more moment for people to enter. I see there's still a lot of people coming in. All right, and we'll get started. So John, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, um, welcome, bienvenue. Uh, bienvenue, of course, you all know what's in French. We're, we're based in Montreal, um, to the second in a series of webinars on the future of aviation. Today, we're going to have our conversation with industry leaders on brighter skies dawning. Um, I'm supposed to say this at the end, but let me give you a warning <laughs> uh, that we're going to have a third webinar on Thursday, March 25th, and it will be a conversation with the newly elected Secretary General of ICAO and his vision of IKEA's future role. He's a graduate, a former student of mine of the McGill University Institute of Air and Space Law. But these webinars are basically hosted by uh, McGill University School of Studies and specifically the Department of Integrated Aviation Management. Um, let us uh, realize that today we're on Zoom and this is rather than a physical uh, seminar, because we're all facing this incredible COVID-19 pandemic and trying to, in fact, uh, handle it. You know, the pandemic has had incredible uh, effects uh, worldwide through government lockdowns and uh, the economic, the health, the political and social psychological effects. And of course, our wonderful aviation industry has suffered devastating results. That's why we're here today to discuss this issue with some of the world's leading experts, both in terms of the challenges and in terms of the opportunities. For those of you who don't know me, and I'm sure it's many, uh, I'm an adjunct professor at the Faculty of Law at McGill University Institute of Air and Space Law, but I'm also a lecturer in the Integrated Aviation Management Program. We have panelists from industry, as well as academia, who are gonna present ideas and thoughts on a number of pre-selected topics. So let me pass you on to, for today's role, he's, he has other roles at McGill, but he's our platform coordinator, David Keenan, who's gonna explain a few of the housekeeping rules for the webinar. Thank David. you, John. Yes, so welcome everyone. Uh, just a few things since we have a full house today, just in case uh, if you uh, are on a VPN or you have any extra applications open, please close those. Those tend to help with the bandwidth and ensure that you have the best quality visual and sound. You can ask questions as we go. Please use the Q&A function. There is also a chat, but for the questions, my colleague Jessica is online and she will be monitoring the Q&A uh, we'll go through those questions periodically on various subjects. Please keep the questions you ask relevant to the topic at hand as much as possible. And uh, also you can ask questions to any of our panelists. Finally, at the end of today's session, uh, within the next 24 hours, you will be sent the recording of this. So uh, without further ado, I'll pass the mic over to John Gredick, who is going to begin with some opening remarks about the industry of aviation. Thank you, David, much appreciated. Maya. Hi, I'm John Grudek. I'm the faculty lecturer at McGill's School of Continuing Studies and the coordinator of McGill's Integrated Aviation Management Program. So what's this webinar all about? What are you gonna be hearing about in this session? 
Well, it's going to be wide ranging and it's going to have a number of topics, which I think will generate conversation, will generate debate, and we'll make sure that we have uh, a lively session for the next 90 some odd minutes. So you'll be hearing about the brightening skies in commercial passenger aviation, resulting from things like unprecedented vaccination efforts, public health initiatives, that there really is a way for uh, some light to be shed on the industry. You'll be hearing about initiatives that airports have implemented to deal with the contactless environment that travelers are going to be expecting as they return to air. Uh, you'll be hearing about the elements of aviation that have done very well during the pandemic, that flourished in fact, things like air cargo has done very well. And we'll talk about drones and uh, remote piloted vehicles and talk about you know, what's going on with that domain and seeing how they evolve and what their futures are looking like. We'll talk about the efforts about the aviation continues on sustainability um, and the environmentally responsible measures that the industry has taken and will continue to take to make sure that it really does maintain its vision about being environmentally responsible. Uh, and you'll be hearing quite a bit about evolving aviation careers and the efforts being undertaken to prepare the workforce uh, from the, for the required skills and competencies. And we'll talk a bit about McGill's uh, integrated aviation program towards the end of the session. And of course, you'll have the opportunity to engage with our panelists and direct questions to them. So the webinar promises to be informative and filled with challenging perspectives. Now back to Professor Saba to get us underway. Okay, in terms of today's program, just so you have an idea of what's happening, of course, uh, we're first of all gonna have uh, our panelists, that's gonna be the vast majority of our time um, to uh, go through two rounds of questions. Um, there's five, I think there's five panelists at the moment, five panelists that we're addressing questions to, maybe six, there's one that's pending. Um, and what's gonna happen is that I will address the questions to them. Uh, they will react with a you know, relatively short response. The other panelists also can react to the questions. Uh, as we go one by one by one. You people as audiences for each round of questions, you can send uh, comments and questions to the chat. And um, our uh, assistant platform coordinator today, uh, Jessica will basically at the end of every round, cite the most poignant questions and comments so we can all listen to them and listen to the answers. Then we'll do the second round. There's only two rounds of questions people and we hope we can do them all because I think a lot of these questions are important and relevant. At the end, my colleague John Graddick will give a very brief summation and at the end I will conclude the, uh, the proceedings even more briefly. So as I told you, as we go through the questions, you can, as the audience, communicate through the chat and at the end of every round of five or six panelists, you're going to basically have your questions and comments uh, read to us and hopefully responded to uh, by the panel. So the first thing I want to do is I just pulled this up this morning. This came out of the Financial Post in, um, and Post Media in, uh, in uh, Montreal and in uh, Toronto and across Canada. Newly released, this comes from yesterday, newly released IATA figures for January show how urgently airlines need air international travel to restrive. While air cargo demand for January hit pre-pandemic levels for the first time, the improvement was not enough to offset a further deterioration in leisure travel. Passenger volumes in January were down worldwide 72% uh, compared with two years ago. Planes globally flew at about 40, I'm sorry, 50% of capacity in January a new all-time low for the month. Airlines are really facing a really tough start to the year in the passenger business, which is where the majority of revenue in normal times comes from. We know that cargo revenue is only 10 to 15% of overall revenues. Um, and of course, that also has an effect on the airports, air navigation providers, and everybody throughout the network, the manufacturers selling planes, et cetera. The first question is to Rene. Uh, you, all, you have all their bios posted on um, the site. So I'm not gonna go over the bios people, but he's VP commercial and reg regional partner at Midas Aviation, which is a United Kingdom based consultancy firm. 
So the first question deals with aviation recovery. What questions? Do airlines know about when the aviation recovery will begin to happen? How long is it gonna take the industry to return to 2019 traffic and revenue levels? Remember, we're way off them. I just read you the numbers from yesterday, I add up. And what will the recovery look like from your perspective? Thank you, John. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. And uh, it, obviously it's not an easy one to answer, but why? I mean, because there are more than 40 variables impacting how we forecast demand today, from macroeconomic indicators and vaccination logistics to passenger fears and anxieties to travel that indeed need to be uh, diminished in order to strengthen uh, booking curve and sell. But to answer your question, in the next 12 months, the focus will be uh, continue being on tier one major domestic cities with limited focus on tier one international routes. Overall, we will observe fewer routes, fewer flights, and fewer aircraft types. In addition, lower seat capacity aircraft will be preferred. If you look at where we are today in terms of airline capacity, we are 47% lower than pre-pandemic seat level. And in my opinion, that's the way it's going to be, and we are going to be hovering over that 50% mark for at least for the next three months, if not more. But the truth is that in the next 12 to 24 months, the airline world will look more leisure travel focused, including more price sensitive travel, more narrow bodies flying, and more point to point flying. Beyond this point, uh, the focus will be on domestic tier one and tier two markets, reaching hopefully pre-crisis demand level by 2023. But that will depend on a speedy vaccination rollout program and reduce travel restrictions among others. In addition, international tier one routes will continue recovering, but I'm a, I am expecting to see a 50 to 60% recovery based on the challenge, on the damage actually inflicted on the global economy and travel behavior shift, including in the business travel se segment among others. Beyond 2024, and again, remember that it's, it's very difficult to forecast right now, even for the next you know, couple of months, but looking at that beyond 2024, domestic tier one, two, and three markets should be fully recovered while international tier one and two markets should show a stronger recovery, but still some stimulation might be needed to reach pre-crisis demand level. Furthermore, it might take between 24 to 36 months based on what we are seeing today and the many challenges we're navigating through for domestic markets to rebound to pre-crisis demand levels, while international markets will take longer, perhaps 48 to 60 months. Besides, remember that although not many are talking about what the impact of uh, I mean, many are not talking about what the impact of on the reduction of the disposable income is. This will may affect obviously travel. And if that is still holds true, GDP contractions and other macroeconomic KPIs will impact how demand recovers. Therefore, the return to pre-crisis demand level will be a slow one, a gradual one, and a very painful one. But to conclude, I just wanted to flip that question over a bit and comment what is key today. And what is key today is to stay afloat and to be able to survive, businesses need to become leaner, more flexible and agile. And that fits quite well under the 6R recovery rule as business from airlines, airports, and to the end-to-end -end travel industry need to reset and rethink their business in terms of priorities, for example, rebalancing liquidity and containing costs, resize and adjust their models to match lackluster demand with new business and operational realities. And besides, business should expect a number of demand reset and restart, therefore executing them efficiently with the right balance of manpower, asset, and capital expects will be the priority to both, uh, to contribute to both, to the top and the bottom line. Therefore, Finally, as there is no previous model that we can that can guide us through this reset, businesses need to relearn from previous restart and factor in the knowledge they have learned from it. Therefore, agility, flexibility, and the opportunity to learn and adjust the path going forward are key until demand and revenue environments improve. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rene. Is there any comment?
the panelists about when you guys, do you agree with his perception of when the aviation recovery is going to happen? Because we I mean, it's, it may be I think, or slower. No, I think he's, he's right on. Um, and the, uh, and the drivers that he's mentioned, I think will be the key. You know, we can, we as, as, the, as the industry uh, can help to drive demand uh, by, by doing some attractive marketing. Uh, but the key elements are going to be what is the global economy going to look like? Um, the domestic markets certainly agree are the ones that will rebound more quickly. Uh, because we still don't have a great deal of uh, integration and, and communication among the various nations. And that's uh, helping to cause this, this uh, degradation on the international front. It's not just the virus, it's the reactions to the virus that are quite diverse among the various countries even in spite of the efforts of ICAO, the European Union, you know, other efforts to try to um, uh, get more, um, uh, pull together the, the country requirements, but it's not happening. And every time there's a, a kind of a bump in the environment, you know, with a new strain or something, you know, countries uh, seem to panic uh, and and have these uh, these these reactions to the shutdown. Yeah, just just to add to Angela's point, maybe a little bit completely closed countries. We're looking at 49 worldwide right now, with 122 partially open and only 44 with you know no restrictions. So it's really getting governments to work together. There is the fear factor, and you know we want to ensure that people are safe. That's that's the whole genesis of the aviation business. But it, it's definitely a challenge to get a coordinated approach when each government has its own constituents to, to sort of manage the fears that are out there um, and that the pandemic's created. Uh, just, just so you know who Kevin is, Kevin is, uh, unfortunately, Louis Philippe Delvalle sent his, his apologies, but because he has an urgent meeting this morning, he can't make it. But uh, Kevin is in um, replacing uh, Louis Philippe Delvalle, who's the Director of General Airports Council International, ACI World. And he's a lecturer in the Integrated Aviation Management Program, but also VIPE, Vice President, Global Assessments and Training at ACI World. And of course, Angela Giddens is our next person who we're going to address a question to. But before I address the question to her, she is the former Director General of Airports Council International ACI World. Any more questions, any more responses to the recovery date? By our colleagues, or everybody, pretty much. Sorry, if I can just, if I can just very quickly add one of the interesting. Both line. Okay. Yeah. One of the interesting things about this crisis is that it has really indicated that we're a cost business. We're not a revenue business. Even though the revenue is sexy, everybody loves it. They love to talk about it. The people that got their cost under control, and you see it with the Ryanairs, with the uh, whizzes of this world have really been able to weather the storm a whole lot better than the rest. And the second item about the crisis is that it has taken a bit this desire of popping up airlines left, right, and center. So there's a bit more capacity discipline that is going to be introduced in the market to sort of match the demand side. So while the demand will be slower to recover, there will be a lot of supply that will be pulled out of the market that sort of is going to balance things out. There won't be the Timbuktu airlines that are going to be around still because they're not going to have the financial means or the backing. Uh, so you're going to see a bit of consolidation naturally in the industry that is going to come about strictly because of the depth of the crisis. And this crisis is, is, is going to end like anything else, right? I mean, it's, uh, I, I know right now there's miscoordination and all this type of stuff, but with the vaccine, hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel or the industry is done. So. And I proceed to the second question, which is to Angela Gittins. Is that good, everybody? Everybody feels comfortable with us. The second question is to our former director, General Airports Council International. And um, the end of COVID is likely to be a matter of opinion. We're talking the, the end. Well, we're talking COVID-19, I guess, right? Because there's all types of variants and who knows what other variants happen in the future. Even if the World Health Organization declares the pandemic over or declares it not over, 
What suggestions do you have for commercial aviation decision makers, particularly those in airports, in terms of their engagement with the regulators, the public, as well as their employees? Well, I would say that communication now becomes more important than ever uh, because of the lack of coordination, because of the confusion, uh, because the whole concept of being over, uh, I don't think has been defined or agreed to uh, around the world or even within some countries. So for airports, um, at least, they're going to have to work more with one, the regulator. I, you know, I don't think we've been treated uh, that well by the regulators. And so the, the messages have to go out to them constantly and repeatedly uh, as, things, uh, as things evolve. To the passenger, to the, to the potential passengers, you know, to the public, that communication uh, has to even get stronger uh, because they're confused. You know, what are the rules? You know, where can you go? What do you have to do when you go there? Uh, so it's going to be up to somebody to, uh, to explain what the conditions are. And the airports and the airlines are going to have to take that on because no one else is, is doing that. Uh, and then to each other within the industry, I agree totally with Renee that there's got to be a reset in the relationships and you know where that goes kind of nobody knows uh, but we cannot uh, continue uh, this industry the way it's been it's just not resilient enough there's going to be more things happening you know it's not just COVID and as you say there's other strains and we may call some of these things something different uh, we're seeing the environmental you know the climate change um, uh, effects that's going to accelerate. So, you know, COVID is going to look at like a day at the beach uh, in, uh, you know, at least for some airports. Look, look at what happened just in, in Texas, you know, just a few days ago. That lack of resiliency uh, is going to kill us uh, because we as aviation are affected by whatever happens uh, in the world uh, because that's, that's our market. Uh, so our resiliency and communication have got to be the watchwords um, for the foreseeable future, even when we get out of this current mess. Any follow-up comments before I move on to the next question to Oltean? No? Okay, Oltean. Uh, he's Executive VP Transformation, Air France KLM. And we're talking about the death of business, air travel, and the recovery. And I quote this thing from the Financial Times this morning, which is based on IATA yesterday. To make matters worse, business travel will probably need at least a couple of years to approach pre-pandemic levels. Brian Pierce said, Brian Pierce is the chief economist of IATA. Because of improvements in teleconferencing technology, some corporate travel just is not going to return. I'm just making the comments and then you can add to it. Many different opinions exist about the death of business air travel as a result of the proliferation of video conferencing technologies, like what we're doing today, webinar, right? And Zoom, et cetera, Cisco WebEx during the COVID-19 pandemic. What, uh, Oltian, is your opinion on business travel demand post -pandemic? What do you think that the airline community should do to enhance business travel demand? We know that's the most profitable sector for passenger airlines, right? So what are they gonna do? I mean, the airlines do quite a bit today uh, yeah. in terms of to, <laughs> to, to try to get the business travel up. I mean, the, from, from my standpoint, yes, it's gonna take time to, uh, on the recovery on business travel, but it's, it's hard to strike a multi-million dollar deal or to even forge the relationships that you need to forge uh, through Zoom. No disrespect to any of my fellow panelists, Duncan, I know, but if we were in person, the chit chatter that we had before this would have been a whole lot more personable. Maybe would have, we would have cracked a couple of jokes that are a lot easier to, to handle. Now imagine if you're cutting a business deal and you're doing it over Zoom, you don't get the feel in how the individual is. And then and, and, and basically what the behavior is, you don't read the body language, you don't see how they uh, what ticks them off, what, what really pleases them. So, so it's, it's hard not to have that human contact, right? And, 
And I mean, I heard uh, from, from the head of European airspace, a very interesting comment that he made. They have obsessed us with the word social distancing. We are not socially distancing. We're physically distancing. And they have instilled it in our head that we're social distancing. No, we're still social beings. We're just standing a couple of feet from each other. But that does not make us unsociable. That's the first part. The second part that I see where, where the recovery is really going to, to be stemmed from, in my opinion, is, is the new generation. The, the, the degree of disloyalty that you get in this generation for no fault of their own in terms of employability in particular uh, is going to force corporations to distinguish themselves with perks and items that is going to adhere to their lifestyle because it's going to be very hard to keep talent when you tell them stay on zoom every single day and oh by the way you're going to work out of your here in paris out of your uh, 30 30 square meter apartment uh, for the rest of the week it's it's pretty hard to get this generation to work that way so for me those are going to be the two key components that are going to bring a business travel back and the airlines, airports, the manufacturers are going to be relevant until we learn how to teletransport people. Right now, the airplane is the way that gets you from point A to point B in the quickest form. If it is a long distance, you can't walk from Paris to China or take a train. It takes a long time. Um, by the way, just to follow up, because it has its limits. I think we have 500 limit. I've got many, many emails and a number of text platform coordinators. Can you let anybody more in more than 500? Because we have a lot of people texting me and emailing me. My box is getting full. Uh, do you know what's happening? Jessica, David, can you let We have reached capacity right now. This event has been very popular. So unfortunately, we will not be able to let, admit more people unless other people leave. But as was mentioned earlier, everybody will be receiving a recording of the session. So we apologize for that. The event has been extremely popular. Um, so unfortunately we don't have the capability of allowing more people in right now. I suspect John Graddick is getting one or two emails too. I don't know, but uh, John, how many people did we have registered? John? I'm playing, I think I saw, we had somewhere close to a thousand. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but yeah, I think, you know, the risk is, you know, as, as Otleon says, I think the risk is, you know, we can video conference and do all kinds of things, but, you know, there are limits to technology. There are things that technology can't do. We're not, we're not there yet. And welcome to the world of technology limits. And uh, unfortunately, uh, hopefully the video representation will be enough to keep everybody interested. Uh, and uh, stay tuned. We're going to do this again. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the panelists will do this in the fall, right? Uh, I think maybe the same group, if, if you people don't start throwing tomatoes at us. And, <laughs> and we'll, we'll, right? we'll, do, we'll do something to do an encore, not to worry, not yeah, to worry. Probably in the fall, but we're, we have the other event that's happening uh, March 25th with the Juan Carlos Salazar, the Secretary General. So anyways, that should be interesting. Um, okay, in terms of Volte on his response, does anybody uh, have any, any um, input? From the, from the panel. I think I, yeah, so if, if I may, I, I think I, I'll jump in and Ultion, I completely agree with him. Look, there's no better um, thing about uh, being in front or across the table from someone when you're trying to structure relationships and deals. And people do business with people they like. I think it's as simple as that. I think the reality is that business travel will come back. Um, we are, as an industry, working on finding ways to uh, ensure that uh, we deliver confidence, not only to individual travelers, but to corporations and to governments, um, that we are uh, preparing um, the uh, process and the infrastructure for people to transit safely. And so I think um, we as an industry uh, have to continue beating the drum um, about the investments that carriers are making. And if you look at the different airlines around the world, there are a number of them who have great wellness programs and who have initiated tremendous programs 
in conjunction with all stakeholders, whether that's the airports, the tourism boards, the hotel associations that they're a part of. At the end of the day, it really is about getting people uh, in front of others. And, and, and I agree with Ultian, um, you know, doing deals in front of someone, understanding body language uh, is much easier when you're sitting across the table. Um, and I think that managing relationships uh, is a key part of business. And it doesn't matter what kind of business you're in. Um, the fact is uh, people do business with people they like. Yeah, just, and just one last question, one last comment, John, for myself. Sure. I think that what you see is probably not going to be, you know, there is going to be business travel. There's no doubt about it. It's coming back. We need the handshakes. We need the eyeball to eyeball in real life to make deals happen. You know, the question is going to be the volume. And, you know, you know, our company is going to be looking at trying to reduce the extent of travel uh, and consolidate travel. And I think that we've seen a number of examples uh, in industries where, you know, you have the travel restrictions and the travel direction that's being given to the staff is such that, you know, we're only going to allow, you know, four or five people to go on a business trip where we normally would have 10 or 15 people go. So it's just the, 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 the volume of business travel that will probably take a bit of time to get back. But, you know, business travel is going to be an essential element of the recovery. And John, on your, on your comment, totally also, right. whoop, go ahead, Duncan. I was just going to say, I, I think the cadence and frequency, obviously, of travel and the number of people who attend conferences and the number of people who attend meetings, I think, is something that uh, CFOs uh, and organizations are going to have some concern around relative to liability. Because uh, let's face it, we, you know, U.S. in particular, very litigious environment. Um, you know, who is going to own that risk of uh, travelers? And I think we need to get our head around that. And again, it's about. Um, what infrastructure can we have in place? What will the COVID uh, vaccines allow? Um, and how confident are we uh, in terms of travel and sending our key people uh, across the country or uh, internationally? Anyways, I think this brings us up to you, uh, Duncan. A question, that, it's just a follow-up question. Uh, you, Duncan Bureau is former senior VP sales and distribution at the Ad Airways. Um, and it's the whole issue of rebuilding trust and confidence because I think Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that leisure travel will take off first, um, but it may not be explosive initially, but when it is going to be explosive, which is going to create incredible amount of jobs in the aviation industry because so many people have been furloughed and retired. I want you people to realize that you're positioning yourself like the Reddit crowd in Wall Street people. Anybody that goes into management and you get a job, that's promotional, okay? If you, uh, you may not get a job tomorrow, but very soon, once the industry takes off, it's going to explode, at least in the leisure industry, particularly. So the question is this. That's my little promo. I try not to be a CNN commentator, but that, that's my CNN comment, okay? Rebuilding trust. As we exit this COVID-19 area, how will aviation organizations rebuild the trust and confidence of both their customers and their employees? Are there any characteristics of corporate culture that will not return? Are there any characteristics of corporate culture that will be reinforced? And can I broaden it, because that's not the question originally, to leisure travel as well? Thank you. Yes, I, so I, I think I would agree that leisure travel will be the first to recover. And I think that we have a tremendous amount of pent up demand. Uh, I think that domestic travel is uh, probably going to be the first uh, to come back. And that's just a function of obviously different government uh, policy uh, and uh, obviously your ability to enter whichever country you want to go to. But um, if you look at some of the very, very large domestic markets, China, India, um, the US uh, and other uh, markets that have very large uh, domestic uh, travel and travel networks, those are the ones that will come back first. Um, and I certainly believe that VFR traffic will come back. Um, I think the tourism boards domestically are going to be looking at a lot of uh, staycation type of programs. There's not going to be a lot of investment trying to get people to fly across the world, uh, certainly in the next 18 to 24 months. I absolutely believe that uh, governments like the US, Canada, India, China uh, will be driving a significant amount of traffic across uh, their domestic borders. Um, and the reality is uh, that, um, you know, again, there's just an incredible pent up demand of people who haven't been able to see their families, who haven't been able to see grandchildren born, who haven't been able to uh, visit their kids uh, at university, 
uh, or whatever the case may be. So I, I definitely think that um, that will be uh, the first wave of travel and then it will migrate into uh, business travel after that. Um, I also think that from a, from a confidence perspective, it's incumbent on the carriers as well as airports and all stakeholders um, that we work together collectively as a tourism industry. It's not just the airlines because every single uh, uh, segment is impacted, whether it's hotels, car rental, restaurants, uh, taxi, Uber, uh, Lyft, all of these uh, companies are impacted and we've seen just incredible loss of jobs and furlough uh, across all of those industries. So again, I think we need some consistency from governments and we need um, all stakeholders uh, to really step up and make sure that they're uh, communicating how they're going to provide safe travel and touchless travel uh, so that we can get the confidence of the traveler back, particularly on the VFR uh, segment. Any other comments? Yeah, just to just sort of tag on to that, I think John, uh, completely echo what Duncan had basically said. Uh, again, one of the issues we have is really getting governments to coordinate their efforts, but really rebuilding that trust. ACI obviously launched the airport health accreditation program uh, that airports are using to, A, the trust, as he said, for the employees, but also trust for the traveling public coming through the facilities to actually apply uh, international best practices uh, as per the ICAO card. So I think that's that very challenge. And what's often forgotten about, we see the airline jobs and the airport jobs that are lost, but all the thousands of jobs, if you just look at my former airport here in Montreal, of concessions and all that, and uh, rental car companies and duty frees that have actually been lost. So it's been a, a significant impact. So it's not just about, I guess, the, the rebuilding trust, also government realizing that it's not big corporations that have lost and all this, it's also people's livelihoods that have been lost throughout this pandemic. Um, I, I was gonna ask you a question. Did you answer that about from the airport perspective, Kevin? Yep, that was the segue, I followed the script. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd just like a comment, you know, on, on Duncan's issue about, about demand, where demand is gonna be coming from and how we're gonna work it. I think that what we see is that, you know, the, the spring that's associated with, with demand, the physical spring that's also associated with leisure demand has been wound up really tight. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of tension out there in terms of people wanting to travel. And I think, you know, there's, there's the regulatory authorities and all the opening of the borders and all the health requirements that are out there. But I, you know, I got a funny feeling that, you know, we're going to be swamped with demand. We are, you know, as soon as that, as soon as the borders start to open and we saw what happened in the UK about 10 days ago when Prime Minister Johnson basically said, you know, we're giving you a timetable and guess what? By June 21, you know, the hotels will be open. Britain will be open. And that's his you know, view in terms of putting a timeline out there and just, you know, the place went nuts in terms of bookings. And so the pe people want to travel. And I think that the question is going to be, are we ready as an industry, whether it's airports, airlines, you know, hotels, you know, we, we are going to be swamped with demand, leisure travel to start with. Uh, and we have to be ready. And I think that, you know, that's the challenge the industry has in making sure we have the resources available for us to basically deploy, whether it's aircraft, whether it's pilots, flight attendants, mechanics, passenger agents, we have to have the resources around to be able to, in fact, meet the demand that's going to be out there. Because if we fail to meet that demand, you know, we are going to be, you know, looking at some significant issues associated with building trust and confidence with our traveling and public. If I can and if I can just add, I think um, we have to think about all of the stakeholders and government plays a pretty big role here. Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, we'll just use Canada as a perfect example. You know, th there doesn't seem to be a strategy, vision um, or consultation. Uh, with industry. Um, and so, you know, we need governments working very closely uh, with uh, all stakeholders. The fact is you can't uh, open the draft, you can't open the doors tomorrow and expect airlines to put aircraft in the air, um, you know, with no ability to pre-sell that inventory and, uh, and have an opportunity to make sure that those uh, pilots are back, uh, uh, back from furlough, those flight attendants are back from fur furlough. These things are easy to stop, but very difficult to turn back on. Um, you know, this is a very, very complicated business. Uh, putting airplanes in the air is not something that you can just do overnight. And uh, particularly with the type of demand that we think we're gonna see, John. So, um, you know, again, I, I think it's incumbent on uh, the Trudeau government and the Canadian example anyway, um, that they be much more consultative uh, and make sure that we have the infrastructure stood up um, to support uh, turning the lights back on. And, I, and, well, I, and, and, that's, I, and that's what I mean about the communication uh, from industry. 
uh, to get that engagement and to keep that engagement. You've got to be in their face uh, because, I mean, I think uh, Canada is a pretty good example. They're pretty much ignoring us. Uh, yeah. I think they have the assumption that, oh, okay, when the virus is over, then everything will go back. Uh, yeah, and they don't to... understand these <clears throat> issues. Uh, airports have similar issues of trying to you know, re regain um, full operation. You know, when that happy time comes, uh, it's, 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 it can't be done overnight. And Canada is one of the only G7s that actually haven't supported the aviation industry. So it's definitely calling the Trudeau government to, to sort of focus on the industry. As Duncan said, you know, shutting down an airport is really fast. Uh, starting everything back up, recommissioning terminals is a challenge, getting the people on board. And what we've seen from an ACI perspective is that uh, insurance brokers, so the insurance companies that insure our facilities are watching this to see what's going to happen. You know, you're going to be bringing people back in. Uh, that have been furloughed out of practice, especially because you know safe and, and health, uh, healthy facilities is the way we roll. Um, it's going to be a challenge for us moving forward. It, it won't just be able to flip a switch and start everything back up. So there's a safety and security yeah. issue here as well. And so again, we, we need to have people who are trained. We need to have the infrastructure in place. We need to have processes in place. Um, you know, we were uh, very uh, concerned about people taking bottles of water uh, through security. Uh, you know, listen, this 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 completely changes that and makes that irrelevant uh, at the end of the day. It's about standing up an industry and all of these stakeholders within that industry, from airports uh, as well as the airlines, um, the ground handlers, uh, and everyone associated with getting an airplane off the gate. Yeah, and okay. one thing that we have to be careful is, I mean, one key example of, uh, you know, getting ready and prepping, you know, operations, hotels, you know, taxis, tour operators, is the uh, the air travel bubble that we see or that was planned between Singapore and Hong Kong. Uh, guess what? It, it was canceled one day before. So just only imagine all the investment that mm -hmm. those hotels, you know, and tour operators made to be ready and to receive that traffic that was expected to be coming, and it, it didn't happen. So on the airline side, I mean, I mean, Liquidity is a scarce resource today, and all the conversation that I have today with all the carriers is basically about liquidity and controlling costs. So by adding excess uh, seat capacity and its high related costs to Zoom, while getting around pools of demand or even uh, new uh, travel restrictions implemented even before 24 hours of departure, which is the case between Singapore and Hong Kong, that might mean putting a business at a higher risk of, of insolvency, including see bank erosion and closing doors. So we have to be careful. And when this demand is coming and is it going to happen or not, because you know, I don't think that many tourism business today can no longer you know, be uh, in business for the next 12 months because they have been waiting for this demand to come. And guess what? It hasn't come. So we have to be very careful with that as well. Um, look at Normally speaking, I would uh, push on to the next theme in the first round, which is sustainability. But we have a few questions from the chat area, so maybe they, they have their hand up. Uh, if you want to just between studies, that's the people out there. Can we take a? We have a lot of questions. I see people <laughs> or something. Fine. Yeah, we can't before, do them you, all. before you jump into the questions, let me give, let me get my sustainability thing out of the way here. Um, and I think and I th I think that's the. Uh, no, that's that's the, the big question. Well, let, me, let me ask the question, okay? Because I'm supposed to be asking <laughs> questions. John. I know you're a little have a different style than me, but I I, I am going to okay, ask. John. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, the issue of then we'll ask the questions and the comments from the chat room in a couple of minutes. Um, sustainability is often suggested as a required element for success in the aviation industry. We all know, but pre-pandemic, the industry is very focused on this. You know, I mean, uh, everybody that's been in the industry knows the last few years up until the pandemic. That's all everybody talked about, including the environmental issues, because sustainability, the environment is only part of sustainability, right? So just realize that those people who understand the concept. I'll let John ask, answer the question first, and then I'll let Kevin step in for it. Um, John, what are some of the more promising sustainability initiatives and their potential entry into service? And then Kevin, representing Airports Council International's perspective uh, from, from the airport there will be a high focus on sustainability of the industry's long-term recovery after COVID-19. What do you think ACI's strategy and the airport strategy will be? Let's start with John, broader, more broadly. Yeah, I, th I think that when you talk about, you know, what are the things that we can do as an industry to kind of regain trust and, and, and confidence from our traveling public, I think it's important that we kind of address 
you know, the, uh, the gorilla in the room that's sitting there and it's called environmental, you know, environmental responsibility and sustainability. And there have been a number of initiatives over the last decade that really have started the ball rolling. Uh, Corsia is one and talking about fuel consumption and how, and how do you min minimize or how do you, you know, try to meet some targets for fuel consumption and carbon emissions. Uh, but there are a number of other things going on. I think the one I, the one I really think is important is, is uh, sustainable aviation fuel, SAF. And, you know, it is a fuel that really is, uh, you know, getting a lot of traction in the industry uh, that really has a, a, a lower emission level and a lower carbon footprint. And I think that, you know, that's the next initiative that's going to be really taking off that, you know, we'll see a lot more airlines and a lot more aviation uh, organizations basically look at sustainable air aviation fuel as a, as, a, as, a, as a big step forward in reducing the carbon footprint associated with air travel. Um, but there's also, you know, there's other things being done. I think we, we've all heard about hydrogen as a fuel and talking about, you know, what do we do about hydrogen and how do we, in fact, look at hydrogen? We talk about electrification. We talk about electrical, you know, electric vehicles, air vehicles. Uh, we're looking at, you know, exchanging or looking at the difference between payload and range of electric vehicles. I don't think we're ready to see an electric vehicle operate yet between Dubai and, and London. Uh, but we are seeing electric vehicles show up. And I think that the technology associated with electric vehicles is coming up. So all of those initiatives are things that, you know, the industry has done, has invested in and will continue to invest to meet its target of trying to become much more environmentally sensitive. So let's move on to the airport perspective, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, John and John. Uh, so, you know, really the future of aviation depends, I think, um, you know, on, on the sustainability uh, issues. Um, for the airport side, it really comes down to our permission to grow. Um, so we're, we're quite aware we're still looking forecasts of doubling of air travel by, uh, by 2040. It's been offset a little bit because of the two years of bad numbers. Uh, but, you know, from a fundamental point of view, we cannot simply just continue to double the facilities and grow the facilities. We need to look at much more efficient ways um, of basically growing it. Now, we talked about carbon sustainability is a much bigger bucket than just the environmental side of it. Um, and I could give you a laundry list of what airports do, but we'll focus more sort of on, on the carbon side. Got a program in place for several years uh, that was started with our, our European region called the Airport Carbon Accreditation Program. And it was sort of a shining light through the pandemic is we actually had 34 airports get certified through the pandemic, uh, which really goes to the seriousness of, of airports sort of you know, cutting everywhere they can. But when it came to you know, reducing their carbon footprint, they still saw that as something that was quite critical for them to continue to grow. And also airports are part of the communities. Angela would always say, it, you know, an airport's a fixed asset in the community and, and more easily reachable, but also yeah. part of the community. So, so really, I think on the sustainability side, looking at carbon emissions, airports are definitely growing um, their facilities, but they're looking at much more innovative uh, ways of actually doing that at the same time of lowering their carbon footprint, but also working with the different actors, right? The airport often doesn't have direct influence with a lot of the actors on the, on the airport property. So we need to actually... Uh, all work together and, and John you touched on you know uh, ground handling equipment that's electrified uh, transport systems such as Uber Lyft uh, that would be actually electric um, so I think it's it's we're on a good map um, and I think really during the worst crisis that ever hit our industry airports still push that forward to, to you know strive to carbon neutral growth um, is a good sign for the future. I think the fact the planes are not flying as much has also reduced the carbon footprint right? Yeah but well, that's short term. Well, yeah. Well, actually, I think that's going to wind up being a problem because, you know, communities are now used to a certain level of non-noise and, you know, when yeah. the noise comes back that they used to be used to, uh, I, I think uh, airports are going to be under uh, a, a great deal of pressure once again. I, I think that's a, that's a good point because Angela Gittins has been coming to my class for many years. Uh, Kevin, uh, when she was the... Uh... The Director General of uh, ACI, and so often pointed that issue. So uh, that's interesting. Um, look, at, we've gone through, we're pretty much a little bit after uh, round one, we finished. We're a little bit more than half time, but we do have some questions. So we'll do our best. We'll probably go through a round two a little bit faster, but we do have to have some questions and comments from, but my God, we have a lot. I have like 67 here. It keeps going. Remember, people, we, uh, we, we had a thousand registrants, but McGill, as McGill is, capped us at 500. So uh, <laughs> we're a public institution, right, John? That's the way it works. 
it's the way it works. Okay? Manage, manage your funding. Manage your funding, exactly. Okay, can we have a couple, few questions and comments? Hopefully you people did some distillation because unfortunately we can't handle all of them at this moment. Yes. Jessica, Jessica over so you. There's a question that uh, continues on the topic of sustainability and Martin is asking, should aviation support changes in travel behaviors that align with global CO2 emission reduction targets or can we accelerate our focus on technological solutions such as sustainable aviation fuels, hydrogen and electrification of air transport to achieve a similar outcome? I think I, think I, I talked about those issues very specifically and I think that you know, the, the, there, there is going to be an accelerated development plan, in my opinion, ab about those about those tools and about those systems. You know, I just, you know, had a quick look at Joby, which is a, a California company that basically is doing electric uh, air taxis. Uh, and our friends over at Lilium, you know, everybody's really, you know, putting a lot of money, a lot of effort, and it's coming from traditional mobility uh, organizations, whether it's Toyota, or whether it's General Motors, or whether it's Daimler, um, you know, they're all looking at aviation as being a very, very viable, electrical aviation being as a very viable alternative to basically looking at reducing congestion, reducing the carbon footprint of vehicles in, in town. And so it, 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 there's a big push and it, it will, you know, it's now gonna be up to the regulators, in my opinion, for the regulators to be able to handle, how are you gonna be able to, in fact, manage this, this, this development cycle of air taxis and electrification in a city environment that happens to be close to an airport. And how do you how do you manage all of this interaction between airplanes and helicopters and now air taxis, which are going to be proliferating? And the question is going to be one of, you know, that is going to be taking an air traffic management um, question. It's going to have to get addressed sooner than later. I think it's going to be interesting for the regulators to try and keep up with all these changes. Uh, that's always sort of been the challenge we saw with the taxi industry here in Montreal, for example, um, trying to catch up with that. So I think that's going to be one of our greatest hurdles moving forward on that. I think, you know, ICAO is trying. You know, they have the, ARP, the RPAS regulations and some of their annexes they put in place to kind of address, you know, this, the start of this whole process. But, you know, there's the whole question of certifying airplanes or certifying these vehicles uh, and, you know, the, the, the whole structure about control and how do you do collision avoidance and how do you get organizations to recognize air traffic control? Do you have an air traffic control management system for these air taxis? And yeah, you have to, otherwise you know, we'll, we'll be into a chaos. So it, it, it is gonna be you know, a very strong, very effective challenge for the regulators to kind of get their act together pretty quickly uh, about what it is it's gonna take for, for air taxis, electrical air taxis to basically evolve because the, the technology is going to be there really quick and demand will be there. And the question is going to be, are the regulators ready for it? Yeah, there's another side to this as well, which is um, when you look at how uh, corporate agreements are being established and uh, even organizations taking some responsibility for their own carbon footprint um, and some of the efforts in terms of uh, what companies are doing to offset those, whether it's some kind of green initiative, whether it's some kind of tax uh, or paying additional uh, fees to offset their footprint. Uh, there's actual efforts to calculate what uh, individual corporations' contributions to the carbon footprint is. And even in RFPs, uh, we're now seeing organizations asking for how airlines are calculating the footprint of uh, their individual travel, what they're doing in terms of alternative fuels, um, how they are uh, migrating to more efficient aircraft. So it's not just on the technology side, there's some uh, accountability and responsibility from uh, travelers and, and corporate travelers. And you can see that around the world. And, you know, I've been part of many uh, corporate agreements where uh, ma many large global international organizations are asking airlines specifically within the RFPs uh, what their response is and what their responsibility uh, and how they're calculating the footprint of individual corporations. So um, I think there's, there's so many different areas that uh, airlines, the airline, the airline sector, the tourism sector uh, are involved in in terms of trying to understand the overall impact uh, that tourism leaves relative to CO2. Uh, let us switch to um, a, a, another question and comment related to our earlier discussion on the recovery and how it looks. Please, Jessica, because uh, we're plus for time. I want to go to round two. Yes, of course. Um, we had several questions actually uh, for passenger travel regarding vaccination passports, if uh, the panel could discuss further on that. 
Yeah. So I, I think from a from a corporate travel perspective, again, I think that um, the health passport is something that we're all going to have to deal with going forward. I, I really don't see a way around it. I think the fact is that uh, we're asking governments to open their borders. We're asking people to travel, um, and we're looking uh, to reinvigorate um, and, and create demand. The fact is, there needs to be some confidence with that. And I think one of the areas that will allow us to have some confidence is the uh, health passport um, in whatever form it is. And there's lots of uh, companies, there's lots of countries that are coming up with different uh, variants of a health passport. But I certainly think a health passport of some kind is here to stay. And I think that uh, we're all going to feel a lot more comfortable getting on an aircraft knowing that everybody around us uh, is also traveling with a health passport um, and they are they have been tested. Um, obviously, that doesn't mean they aren't carrying the virus, but it certainly uh, lessens the risk. And I think that is something that we're all going to have to deal with going forward. Can I add well, and that And that coordination really needs to start yeah. now. Uh, because you know we could wind up in the same situation as we have done with the other travel restrictions being uncoordinated, that if one country has a uh, health passport given X vaccine, is that going to be accepted uh, by the country of arrival? And I certainly would like to see the kind of uh, leadership from WHO and uh, various governments to get that going. Now, I don't think they know enough right now, just the, the, just the state of play in the science, uh, but it's something that they need to start organizing uh, and recognizing the need for uh, very soon. Hopefully, you know, hopefully um, you know, the whole vaccination rate will be so high that this becomes an urgent matter. I think yeah, and just you know, to echo that, that'll be an important, and just to give you the flow, if you look at uh, some airports that are actually doing testing on arrival, they can handle 275 passengers an hour. There's no scalability on that. So, I mean, the passports is going to have to be the way to go. You got an A330, that doesn't even cover one A330. Um, so I think that the health passport is going to have to be the way to go, whether we like it or not. Um, we see that with the yellow fever vaccine for years. We traveled in Africa, it was there. So it'll just be an added travel document, whether it's electronic or not. And I had an announcement yesterday that said bring health measures between countries have created a mess of inconsistency. I think that's what both of you are touching upon. Global air airlines are urging governments to agree on universal COVID-19 testing and vaccination standards uh, ahead of an expected restart in international air travel. And they have developed their own mobile application, but we got to manage, you know, some standards that everybody agrees to. Yeah, I, but I think, you know, I, the, the, you know, the issue is we've got the WHO is basically stipulated right. that you know they're not in favor of these of these Correct. passports, and Correct. I'm saying what you know I'm trying to understand consistency and making sure that we've got a we're speaking with one voice, and I think that you know we've got a we've got an issue uh, with you know agencies uh, that basically are, are talking at opposite ends of the spectrum here, and I think that we somehow how and however we do it we've got to get consensus, and whether it's a consensus that's coming from ICAO or whether it comes from the governments, whether it comes from the UN, wherever it comes from, you know, we've got to get everybody talking the same language and not talking around how do we make this thing ubiquitous so it goes across all country borders and not just some and not and not on others. So it, it, there, it, it is a big issue as far as I'm concerned. Um, is there yeah, any is, more questions that we can comment on or can we move on to round two? Do you think we've covered most of it, Jessica? Um, I mean, there's a lot of questions, uh, some of which uh, relate more specifically to um, post-pandemic travel costs for leisure travel and how that will be impacted by the current situation. So I'll let I, you decide if we'd like to answer that. I think we'll, maybe questions and comments will be addressed in round two, I think, because, okay. okay, so we're in round two. We're a little bit behind, but not that much. And our first three panelists will address this uh, issue, first of all, in terms of the airlines, and then in terms of the airports. Um, I know Renee is answering this question, but I know Duncan has a strong position on this. I, th I think from an old position on this, if I remember correctly. It deals with costs of airlines. Right? Zolti and I know that we've talked about the cost, but I'll, addressing the question to Renee, and, and on the cost side, airlines, but then you can further enhancement to the answer, Zolti. On the cost side, airlines need to continually and aggressively reduce costs through multiple cost cutting rounds. What additional measures and initiatives do you recommend to contain costs? This question is to Renee, but like I said, I know Oldian has some comments, I'm sure. 
Yeah, thank you. I mean, on the labor contract side, we have observed airlines and airports implementing a number of measures from voluntary unpaid leave, early retirements, pay rate changes, unpaid vacation, short, short time, four loads, and even a strategic layoff. In a typical bankruptcy filling and internal restructuring, especially, you know, an average 60% of the cost reduction might could potentially come from labor contract and concessions renegotiations besides productivity enhancement. Therefore, I'm expecting to see additionally additional measures in terms of linear management structures and processes supported by technology. Besides, we may observe additional labor concessions and higher productivity rates negotiated by full service carriers with their unions, as typically they have a 40 to 50 percent cost disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis ULCC players. Therefore, I'm expecting that those uh, cost disadvantages will come down to 20, 25 percent at the end uh, after further concessions and restructurings are implemented and executed. If this holds true, uh, which I'm hoping it does, full service carriers may be looking at cutting at the end between 35 to 40 percent of their cost inefficiencies while increasing labor productivity. Uh, increasing uh, uh, streamlining operations and processes and reducing full-time employees uh, per aircraft headcounts, again, using technology. Uh, therefore, we may, uh, we may see about to see a more cost balance battle among these two players in the near future, which is, which is going to be really good to see. In addition, uh, workforce salary cuts at all management levels may continue to artificially hedge an operation from a liquidity point of view. Besides, I mean, we can talk about airlines, airports, and tourism businesses may continue strategi strategically moving as many fixed costs to the variable side. One key example is payment by the hour agreements. We are talking about aircraft rentals, we're talking about engines, APU, as one tries to move as many fixed costs to a variable lower cost base strategy. In addition, and depending on how demand behave going forward, new rounds of contract renegotiations with suppliers and aircraft lessors may be needed, including evaluating payment deferrals, uh, reductions uh, in contract uh, and, and, and reductions, uh, contract timeline extensions being renegotiated with lessor to make up for the shortfall in income. Moreover. Uh, renegotiating on a second and a third round of aircraft delivery timelines with OEMs might be needed, especially when we are talking about white body aircraft. Furthermore, taking a second look, look at the fleet strategy in terms of further simply flying the fleet, as that means fewer aircraft types, which can bring key savings related to crew training and maintenance expenses, just to name a few. And lastly, I am expecting to see more development in terms of low CapEx unique partnership, even with competitors that can help a business to exit a marginal route while providing a more attractive, attractive network to its customer base in an asset-like manner, which means continue offering connectivity at a minimum capital cost. Thank you. Uh um, Otian, do you have any response? Because I know you, you always talk about costs. No, uh, absolutely, John. I think uh, I, I completely agree with Rene. What the, the traditional steps on an airline are to reduce the cost. There is one variable that we could use that is additional uh, to, to really paradigm shift what we do, which is data. Up to now, airlines use data to problem solve instead of looking at data in a holistic way in how not only to improve the revenue quality and, and, and the ability to collect more revenue and ancillaries, but also on the cost side and on the operations side. I, I can give you a very simple example. In CDG, we've got 70% of our US flights that are basically, they do self-check-in, they do self backdrop everything is done by themselves. Yet when I look at the number of agents that we've got in the counter, it doesn't change from a flight to, uh, to I don't know, to, uh, to Chile. Even though the behavior of the customers is very, very different because we're not using enough data to really improve. So I think sort of the, the added bonus that the airlines have at this time during the time of crisis is really to holistically look at data and put it into perspective to paradigm shift what 
what our business is, which is not going to change because we are A to B. Well, I, mean, I would I, I would agree with that, and I would say that you know more broadly, um, having more integration of data and and communication among the players, you know, particularly airports and airlines, uh, the ground handlers and 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 um, traffic management should should be accelerated because it it creates efficiencies for the for all of the parties. So I would see uh, an acceleration of uh, ACDM. I see there was one of the questions uh, about that uh, because again, we, we can't keep going the way we're going and, and, and take all of these costs out of the system. I would say one comment on what Renee said uh, in terms of the uh, airlines restructuring their labor agreements, it's gonna be interesting to see for these national carriers uh, who have gotten a lot of subsidies from their governments, uh, what's going to happen, what's going to be the reaction of these governments when they uh, try to do some of these restructurings because the labor unions uh, are going to go to government and, and try to resist that. Um, and you know, will we kind of go back to a, a level of protectionism as the governments try to kind of return to a status quo that doesn't meet the market anymore. Yeah, I, I think I would add a couple of things to this as well, relative to the cost side, uh, John, if you don't mind. I think, first of all, LCCs are not immune to cost reduction either. And so I do agree with Renee that uh, the uh, carriers are all looking at their costs, but it's all carriers, not just the legacy carriers. Um, and, you know, if, if I'm Ed Sims at WestJet, I'm certainly thinking about how I can make my operation even more efficient, reduce my uh, cost of capital, reduce my cost of operating, um, and how do I get more efficient, more utilization out of my aircraft, more uh, utilization out of my labor. So, uh, you know, rising tides raise all ships. And the fact is, the traditional carriers are absolutely looking at getting cost out of their business, whether that's labor agreements, whether that's flying more efficient aircraft, retiring airplanes, accelerated retirement of aircraft, um, and then renegotiated agreements with labor groups. Um, the other thing that uh, from a cost perspective, um, you know, I, I think there needs to be a, a thought around the distribution of margin. Um, historically, airlines uh, were the lowest uh, uh, margin uh, in the in the industry. You know, they're the ones with all the cost of capital, uh, and yet, uh, you know, distribution partners and uh, partners throughout the value chain all made significantly higher margins than the carriers. So, um, you know, for carriers to continue, there needs to be a redistribution of margin, and that comes in choices of distribution. It comes in choices of stakeholders and partnerships. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens post-COVID um, as airlines think about their cost structure, think about uh, how they can extract margin and more margin um, from their uh, overall business. Can I add something in terms of the airports? Because we do have two people. We, we try to be balanced, right? And we Always to be a good balance. Thanks, John. Huh? Um, <laughs> I, I, well, the, there's a financial squeeze on airports after COVID-19 disappears, mm. right? Yeah. Yeah, so in terms of numbers, we're looking at, uh, well, the, the financial squeeze just for 2020 was a loss of 112 billion uh, US. If we look at just the Canadian airports, it's about 5.5 billion. Again, we come back to, uh, to what Ottawa's not doing. Um, so there's a lot of innovations. You know, the positive point is it's driven innovation against the pandemic. Uh, we looked at, obviously, there's been, uh, you know, layoffs and furloughs, about 33% worldwide of airport employees. So the actual uh, people who work for our members have been reduced uh, through either uh, volunteer retirements, uh, renegotiating some deals with the concessionaires. So obviously a lot of the, the, the concessionaires that are actually in the airports um, that have a certain revenue cap, they're supposed to show the revenue. Those, the airports have been you know, willing to, to look at that and revisit that. I think Singapore is a good example of that. Uh, but I think coming back to, you know, we talked about data and all that, same thing for the airport is how do we, how do we sort of focus more on the customer and, and derive future opportunities to, to better serve the customers or customize their experience? It's really what they're looking for, right? Uh, going through the facilities. So there's opportunities there um, as far as the commercial offerings or certain additional ancillary revenues that airports could actually make off of the, uh, off of the traveling public. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, though, the, the good point is we didn't reduce on environmental sustainability because, again, that comes back to our right to grow. Um, and going back to the European airports reference with like CDG is a prime example. Uh, there's been reductions in, in CAPEX uh, in a lot, of, uh, a lot of airports, although that might bite us in the long term. Uh, so again, I think airports have, have done a lot to, to reduce costs 
And, uh, you know, we're conscious, we're in this together. The airlines, you know, are successful, more successful and vice versa. And that's, you know, it's a business deal. And then we need to just work at, uh, at you know, serving the ultimate customer, which is the traveling public. Angela, do you have any anything to add in terms of uh, where do they continue to cut costs or uh, add revenues or infrastructure investment and uh, customer service in terms of the airports? Well, I think we're going to see more attempts at, at partnerships uh, as they try to build back better uh, because they can't, uh, they don't, they're not going to have the funds uh, to do everything themselves. Uh, and they're, they're looked at, the airports are being looked at as the ones to give the concessions uh, to the airlines, to the retailers. Uh, so the squeeze is on the, air, on the airport. Uh, as they try to come out of this, uh, because they, obviously they can't continue to do that. So I think we're going to start to see, and I think we've already started to see some innovations in the business relationships that airports have uh, with the various players. If I can just add one more comment, sorry, if I can just add one more comment in probably more uh, a Canadian issue uh, is certainly around um, the, uh, the belief that airports are just this continuous tax opportunity for governments. I think we need to rethink how, uh, you know, airports operate in Canada. The fact of the matter is uh, the tax burden on assets that have been paid for multiple times uh, is something that just gets passed on to the traveling public. And again, I think there needs to be some more thought leadership from the Trudeau government in terms of uh, airport infrastructure, cost of operating into airports, and the burden put on airports in terms of taxes, of fees, and service charges, again, for properties that have been paid for multiple times. Um, it's disappointing that the Trudeau government hasn't uh, uh, had led uh, you know, this aviation sector a little more uh, carefully. And I have a follow-up question to you, Duncan, in terms of hub airlines. Um, how will airlines, based on the hub model, and there's a lot worldwide, right, be able to build the confidence of travelers who might be co-mingling with virus-carrying travelers at the hubs? And I think maybe the airport people might also want to say something because mm -hmm. that is where the hub is, right? Let's start with you, Duncan. Yeah. Yeah, so look, I think Altion's going to have a very uh, a strong opinion on this as well. Um, the fact is, hub carriers obviously um, are going to have some risk in terms of their network. The fact is that corporations, and we saw it in some RFPs even before COVID uh, and during COVID as we were talking to corporations looking for direct travel in order to reduce the risk of connecting and uh, connecting through hub airports uh, being intermixed with travelers from all over the world. Um, again, I think that point-to-point uh, -point airlines are going to have some advantage. Uh, obviously, uh, there is a need for a hub uh, and spoke carrier, uh, given their economic model and the size of their fleet and size of their network, as well as all of the interline partners and co chair partners that they have. Um, so again, it's going to be a partnership with airports. How do we uh, transit uh, people through a hub airport? How do we make sure that there's as little contact as possible? How do we make sure that um, that experience is something that continues to be a good experience um, and uh, limits the amount of layover and the connectivity? So it's all about network planning and a relationship with the airports to make sure that the traveler experience is safe. Um, but again, at the end of the day, uh, I, I, I did did see a number of corporations asking specifically about point-to-point -point, uh, traffic in order to reduce the exposure of their employees going through hub airports. So it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out, but uh, it is going to be an industry solution and airports and airlines are going to have to work well uh, together to make sure we create an environment of, that that transit is something that's safe uh, and comfortable for everyone and, and affordable, quite frankly. Any comments from Multian and from the airport people? Well, just what's interesting, we're, we're seeing a bit of a change now also with the, the public health authorities, right, that didn't have much of a footprint in the airports and that, um, and I'll give you an example, Montreal, they're actually the ones working between CBSA and, and Public Health Authority of Canada because you know, talking to each other has to be a better coordination also at the government level of what measures are in place. So always be a level of risk. Um, absolutely what Duncan said, working together with the airlines and, and, and making sure that we're able to get people through safe and secure. Uh, but I think it's really going to become after almost a 9-11 where security got this visibility or this, this, this footprint on the airport is going to be these public health agencies um, that don't quite understand our business. Um, and that's really coming back to where industry needs to, to influence even more. We're working with WHO, working with ICAO, working with the, the national authorities. Uh, but I think there needs to be a you know, as this thought leadership was used by one of us, uh, greater thought leadership in that. And that's going to help us, um, obviously, uh, industry side uh, work to get the people back and make them safe. 
going through the facilities. Point to point is something we've been hearing too, where people want to avoid, um, you know, connecting if they can. John, if I could add very two two very quick comments. Our our two airlines are very different from each other. Uh, Air France and the French market is the largest inbound market in Europe. So the, the opportunity for point to point is, uh, is, is, is there for Air France. When it comes to Schiphol and KLM, that is the best connecting airport in the world, actually. That's the model. Mm -hmm. So by default, having those two facilities uh, uh, helps. And if I could add to what Kevin said, I tend to disagree that we should allow governments to sort of make this after what happened to 9-11, where you still have to put your bottle of water through. So we cannot make the assumption that our costs are going to go up because it's going to kill our industry. Uh, I mean, we've got sustainability coming up. We've got now new health requirements. I think like this crisis, 1967, 6.7 million people died worldwide because of the Hong Kong the flu, nobody talks about it. We have two and a half million people that have died. Yes, it's a significant number, but we're twice the amount of people in earth that what we have been then. So we cannot assume that our world all of a sudden is gonna be turned upside down and, and accept it because it's gonna kill the industry. It's just, we, we have very thin margins, at least on the airline side and airports, you guys are dependent on us because if there are no airlines, there are no airports. And I move on to another issue because we've been talking about passengers, leisure and business, whether from the airline or the airport perspective, oh, we're going to shift to air cargo, which is roughly about 10 to 15 percent of revenues of um, the airlines. But of course, as a percentage, it's gone up during the pandemic. And I'm going to address the question to John Graddick. Air cargo has been an important contributor to supporting and generating income for aviation during this pandemic. Indeed, there have been several initiatives launched to convert passenger aircraft into a cargo only configuration. Is this a short term action pending the return of regular air service? Or is this a transformational change to aviation? John Graddick. And others can comment afterwards for a minute or two. Yeah, I think that what you see happening now in terms of the cargo world uh, evolving into freighters and a number of freighters that are showing up uh, or either in production or into the uh, modification programs uh, is probably, you know, the fact that we've got a shortage of passenger capacity. You know, cargo typically represents, the freighter operation typically represents somewhere in the range of 10 to maybe 15% uh, of the typical revenues that an airline has. Um, but the majority of cargo space that is flown around the world does come from passenger airplanes. And I think that, you know, what we see is that as passenger airplanes start to be activated and the networks start to show up, uh, we are going to see a significant amount of cargo capacity showing up in the belly of these passenger airplanes. Um, so there might be an overreaction on the part of some carriers to, in fact, create this, this, this supply side of freighters that may be leading to an oversupply in the marketplace two years from now, three years from now when the when the, when, the, when the joint production aircraft start flying back again. So um, it, it's, it's a risk that the airline, that the uh, aviation community is taking and putting all this crater capacity in there. There is definitely you know, a lot of demand and there's value in flying freighters today. Um, and you still have passenger airplanes being flown as freighters today. Uh, so how long that will last is a question of when, you know, the, the, the majority of the passenger airplanes come back. So it may not be, that that uh, that much of a uh, of a profitable uh, operation come you know 36 or 48 months from now. But in the meantime, bring those freighters on. We need them. We're, we're coming close to the end, so I'm going to have uh, we have a few more questions, but I'll I'll end it with Oltian's last question, a few comments, and then uh, John Graddick will summarize for us. Okay, um, Oltian, uh, in terms of future careers, because we have a lot of people on board here who used to have careers and no longer have careers but want to resuscitate them or upgrade them and we have a lot of students who wonder whether or not it's worth studying aviation management uh given the crisis we have been experiencing here why would anyone want to work in the aviation industry what is about this industry that continues to attract talent i'm sure everybody still finds the industry incredibly attractive i do you know 
I, I, I think it's uh, no day is the same. I, I can tell you guys, it's, uh, I started as a financial analyst at Air Canada, I've made it in, uh, as an EVP. I've, I've had some lucky breaks in, in my life, but I enjoy it as much today as I enjoyed it the first day that I started at Air Canada. It's, it's one of the most fun industries you would ever step your foot into. Uh, it, it sort of allows you to travel worldwide. It allows you to grow personally. It has, we've got businesses that you guys talked about cargo right now. We haven't touched maintenance. We talked a bit about pilots, flight attendants. We can talk about procurement. We can talk about, you name it, we have it. And it's 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 separate sort of, uh, at, at least on, on, on this end. And airplanes are fun and they're not going anywhere. Not anytime soon, I think. We, we still would like to travel and, and it's going to get more prevalent after the after this goddamn sickness is uh, is over, <laughs> so I think I think sometimes people can find it frustrating, but it's uh, I, I cannot think of a more rewarding industry that uh, than 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 the aviation in general, mm -hmm. specifically the airlines. I have a chat comment here. It says, "Yes, it's a very unique field to be in. I miss it." It's Look, I, uh, I, I, uh, I share Altian's love for this industry and so much so that I tattooed an airplane on my arm. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, there's, there's, I think when you're in this industry, there's just so much opportunity, whether you're uh, on the operational side, the commercial side, uh, whether you're an airline pilot, whether you're a cabin crew, there's just so many great careers and so many opportunities to see the world. Um, and, uh, you know, this industry is full of amazing people, whether it's on the airport side, whether it's on uh, the tours, the tourist side, the travel agent side. Uh, this is a great industry. Um, you know, I've made lifelong friends uh, in all sectors of this industry. And, uh, you know, I've, it's been an incredible pleasure for me to be in it for the last 25 years. And um, I, uh, I certainly will not be leaving this industry anytime soon. Um, so I think anyone wanting to come into this industry, anyone wanting to come and join your program uh, and learn about aviation and what kind of roles and um, opportunity there are, it's it, quite frankly, it's endless. Yeah, I think it's a bump in the road. Uh, I'll one up Duncan. I'm, I'm an airport guy, but I married an airline woman. So, you know, that's even better <laughs> to show my passion. But I guess I guess you've seen it from what everything's been said here is the passion we have in this industry. Um, it is an industry that's there's a lot of innovation. It continually changes, which makes it exciting. I, I think on, on the airport side, we're the unknown sort of part of the industry. It's like running a, a city, sometimes bigger than a city. Uh, we have biologists, uh, dog handlers, firefighters, heavy equipment mechanics, marketing specialists, um, you know, people in HR and finance. Um, and, and there's, you know, it's airports are one of the only industries it could be a good or bad where people tend to stay that we have a lot of lifers. Uh, but it's not because it's sort of just doing the same thing. People are passionate about what they do. Um, and, and my former colleagues at the uh, Aeroport de Montréal are many of them still there. Thank God they're still there. Um, they're still passionate and it's their airport um, and you see that around the world and there's the, the, the greater community we talked about, uh, you know, uh, we see it in the airport side is, is people are happy to help each other out and connect. So, uh, yeah, we have a bump in the road. Uh, it's, it's an industry that always learns from previous uh, mistakes and, and challenges and we always come out stronger. So uh, I don't think at all it's a bad investment. I think it's a very good investment. Before I, I, I turn to Jessica for a minute, I just, I read, a, I'm reading a couple of chats here. They sound interesting. Probably the aviation transport industry after COVID-19 can be much more prosperous than before. A new summit is to come. I believe that. Me too. Yeah. And, we, and I think we've got to work together, you know, as an that's industry. Right. And that's why it's, it's got to be an integrated answer. It's got airports alone can't solve the problem. Airlines alone can't solve the problem. Security can't solve the problem. Manufacturers can't solve the problem. So there's a lot of things that we have to do in concert. And I think this COVID uh, exercise that we're going through uh, is teaching us the value of integrating. And we see now that, you know, we, unless we have a better integration across both government, health, pub, public health, and the aviation industry, that we really, you know, are, are going to be stag, you know, stuttering our way through back to prosperity. But I think that uh, it's a lesson learned from this exercise is that, you know, we have to work together. And it's got to be everybody working together to get this thing done. Uh, Jessica, can you read one or two comments or questions? Because I know we're running out of time. We only have five minutes. John wants to say something for two minutes, and I'm going to say goodbye. By the way, uh, Jessica, can can the panelists and myself meet for a couple of minutes after without everybody else? Is that possible? Tech 
I believe so, but we can check in right at the very end, play okay. around. Are, are the panelists willing to sit around for a minute or two afterwards? I know everybody's busy. Right? Sure. No problem. Okay, we just read a couple of questions and I'll have John do a summation and I'll say bye to everybody. Yes, so we've had several questions about uh, post-pandemic for leisure travel fares and if there is expected to be any increases in this uh, in this regard. Altian, over to you, sir. <laughs> I actually believe that the revenue management teams are gonna screw this up because <laughs> they've got no historical data. <laughs> so I think I think the travelers should not be worried about that because I think it's gonna come like a big tsunami in terms of when it comes when it, uh, to, to the VFR. So all the optimization systems that are in place are not going to do much good. Uh, but yes, I mean, if, uh, if, if the demand is, gonna, is going to, to, to be over the supply, by all means, you're going to see a hike in fares. It's like anything else, right? Uh, if, if you've got uh, under supply and over demand, you're going to end up seeing tighter inventories if the airlines manage it correctly. But I think we're going to have a hard time really finding the sweet spot you know, because we're just right. for revenue, while at the same time we want to we want to keep the yields up. You don't want to be uh, the the first. I mean, we're seeing the U.S. carriers are being a bit more aggressive when it comes to their uh, to their yield management. Uh, the Europeans are more on the cautious side when I look at point of sale between Europe and uh, uh, and let's say U.S. or Canada. Uh, U.S. because Canada does not have a market right now, thanks to our uh, beautiful government. <laughs> Uh, being that I'm Canadian as well, uh, but uh, but that's that's a bit the fight. I, I think we're going to have a hard time finding the sweet spot as airlines. But uh, but yeah, you can see some some price hikes. And I think, and I think you I would... know most most of the behavior of the, of the of demand is really close in. Like we used to have people booking in three, four, five months out. Now we're lucky if people book in a week out. We're really lucky. So you know we're going to have to change the way in which we understand capacity and the way we, we offer our fares. But I'm, we, you know, the question is going to be one of how much do you want to, you know, peeve off your customer by having sky high prices. And, oh. you know, that's going to be a very fine line to walk in terms of yeah, well, pricing I, I, capacity I, to pricing. I, I, I think one of the biggest issues is Altium's already re re referenced it is all of our historical data that we use to price uh, and predict um, loads is no longer relevant. And so uh, we don't know what the future booking curve is going to look like. And John, you're right. There has been a significant change in terms of booking curves. And so even if you look uh, prior to COVID, there had been a massive shift towards departure date uh, from historical uh, bookings. And, and again, uh, it's market dependent. You know, India has a very different booking curve than North America, which has a very different booking curve than Japan. Um, and again, all of our historical data that we use to predict uh, and uh, calculate what kind of yields we can get, what kind of load factors we can expect on a flight, which helped us uh, price, is irrelevant today. And so moving forward, um, we don't know what the demand is going to look like. So um, it really will be who has a stronger stomach in terms of uh, a pricing model and who's going to hold on for yield uh, or who's going to try and pick up every single dollar they can uh, to ensure that they're covering their variable cost of operation. So it'll be interesting to see the pricing, uh, what the pricing model looks like. I think we're going to have to come to a close because I, I have to control the time. But actually, I see a comment here from somebody I, I've worked with previously as a friend, Pulsat Oldatula. Maybe some of you know her. She was the... Transport Bureau of IKEA, she's right at the end. She says, the industry, prestigious, prestigious, exciting, provides ample opportunity to see the world and learn. COVID-19 came and will go away. The industry will bounce back at some point. And she says, good luck to all. So it's somebody who I've, I've worked with at IKEA when she was there, Transport Bureau from, I think she was a delegate from Nigeria. Anyways, I, this is a good prelude to the summation from our, my good friend, uh, John Graddick. Thank you, John. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the panelists. I think you know, guys, did a great job. Thank you for accepting the invitation to participate. It's been a lot of fun, uh, as I knew it was going to be. So, I, you know, I, I hopefully the participants found this conversation and this debate dialogue thought-provoking and interesting. Um, the McGill School of Continuing Studies is honored to present these series for the future of aviation as a means to engage professionals in learning more about aviation. Um, the school's Diploma in Integrated Aviation Management has been designed to further the discourse that you've heard today among the panelists. So 
the capable, it's being, you can complete the course in about a year. Um, the pl diploma is an intensive overview of the different aspects of aviation that you may have heard about today, including things like air nav, airports, airline, cargo, finance, economics, safety, security, and regulatory oversight. So we cover a number of different subjects in that program. Uh, and the participants in the program come from a variety of backgrounds. And there may be some who have some experience in airlines, some who don't have their experience in aviation. So we tend to bring everybody together in a team environment to allow them to better understand the integrated aspect of aviation and to help you know, succeed in aviation. So our graduates, and many of them are here on this webinar, thank you very much for participating, uh, can attest to the learning experience that we get out of this program and the value that the program has provided them. So if you're interested in learning more about the program, uh, we'll be mailing out details uh, in the coming days about the program, about the information that you may need to make a decision as to whether or not you wanna participate in these programs. So I look forward as program coordinator to welcome you to McGill and your future in aviation. Thank you once again for being here today. It was our pleasure to be discussing aviation with all of you. So I just wanna conclude our, 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 I'm sorry, we're making it pretty close. Uh, so the plane almost <laughs> arrived on time, 1.30, right? I just wanna remind you of our next webinar, which is in, on the future of aviation series, which again will be on Thursday, March 26th. I think you'll receive the information and it will be from 6 to 7.30 p.m., okay? It will be Juan Carlos Salazar, by the way, he's a graduate of another adjunct professor in the Faculty of Law, he was a, and he's a fantastic person. We'll have a chance to chat with him, and he will talk about his vision of IKEO's future role. He will be coming on August 1st. Um, I also want to thank the panelists. It was great, you know, at, uh, working with them, and hopefully we can do this event again, not future aviation, but this group again, sometime over the next few months, because I think it was a very good group. And I hope you people can all attend. I also want to ta uh, thank the Continuing Studies Department at McGill, as well as Department of Integrated Aviation Management. And at the end, I want to thank you, the audience, because otherwise, myself as moderator and the rest of us will be a bunch of fools talking in virtual space if you weren't there, to be honest with you. So it's wonderful to be with you. Um, you all stay safe, strong, and determined. In Quebec, we never say goodbye. I always end it this way. We always say au revoir. In French, that means until we meet again. So uh, strong, safe, and determined until we meet again. Panelists, let's hang around for a couple of minutes and have a great day, people. Bye. Wow, <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> we saw people on board, eh, uh, John? We we'll just let's, I don't know how. Yeah, to... don't worry. Okay. I'm here. We'll wait for Jessica. Yes, so unfortunately, there's not a way for us to enter um, a separate space oh. right now. Um, what we can do is that I can send you all a separate link. And if you'd like to join there, or if you'd like to join on one of your personal accounts, that's possible as well. You can send okay. us a link.